Hey, my name is Marcin Lewandowski. I'm middle distance runner. I used to be middle distance runner, uh, 1500 meters. Uh, you are very welcome in Athlete Mondial. Hi, everyone. You're listening to the Athlete Mondial podcast. Athlete Mondial is French for athletes of the world. In this podcast, I interview track and field athletes from all around the world in their native language when I speak it. My guest this week is Marcin Lewandowski multiple European and world medalist in the 800 and then the 1500 meters. Among many other achievements, much won gold in the 800 meters at the 2010 European Championships in Barcelona and bronze in the 1500 meters at the 2019 World Championships in Doha. In this episode, Martin tells us about his relationship with his brother, who was also his coach, but also about his relationship with Adam Kshot. He tells us about moving up to the 1500 meters, and about his new life now that he's retired from the sport. You're listening to the original interview in English, because I don't speak Polish, but the interview is also available dubbed in French for those of you who understand French better than English. Enjoy! Are you ready? I was born ready. <laughs> oh, you were born ready. Okay, good. Welcome to the podcast. Hello, hello. Cześć Marcin, witam cię w moim podcastie. Something like that. That's perfect. I understand everything. That's all I know. For people That's who perfect. don't know, it means welcome watching to, to my podcast. That's all I know. So the rest will exactly. be in English. <laughs> How have you been since we last saw you compete on the circuit? Uh, many change, uh, many things change in my life, but I'm a very happy person right now. The moment when I when I finished my career was not it was not so easy, especially because it was not only my decision, but especially it was because of a healthy problem with my daughter. So in that moment, that was only one right uh, decision. But so far, it's already one year almost. I mean, one year uh, after this moment, it happened already. But uh, I still continue my, uh, my decision. I mean, I'm very happy as a human being, as an athlete. So a uh, new life starts right now for myself. I'm very enjoy that. and. Uh, Let's see what's going to happen soon as well. So what's your new life like? I'm quite busy man right now, I can say. I mean, of, of course, I'm still very active as an athlete. I'm still running, of course. I'm still very fit. Maybe it's not enough to get another world medal, but uh, I'm still very fit. I like it so much. It was all my life, you know, yeah. since uh, when I was really young till right now. So uh, I can't just finish like that. But I, I'm doing that mostly for a military right now. Okay. Yeah, and I enjoy it so much. I'm also uh, I'm all the time in touch with the athletes also because I'm working for a Polish uh, sports agency, Marcin Rosengarden uh, athletes team. So uh, I'm still in touch, and because of that, I can still follow uh, with the all athletes. I can travel all the time to the beautiful places and meet with athletes, with the organizers, with the other agents. So um, it's also very happy. I'm also working for a big sports company in marketing team uh, of Decathlon. I'm also represent uh, sports uh, brand uh, Kipran, and I'm also doing uh, power speed. So there's many, many things, but uh, I enjoying so much. And uh, that's this is my new way of life right now. And uh, it gives me a really huge kick because I still want to improve. I still want to make my dreams come true. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with that. The Gatlo and Kipron are French brands. Exactly, exactly. So you, you compete for the military. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's why I'm still uh, very fit because uh, as you know or not, I'm not sure, but uh, the level of a middle distance uh, event in, uh, in the military is really high. Sometimes mm -hmm. if you want to win an Olympics military game, you have to run 144 in the final. So it's not wow. easy. Yeah. Okay. How is your daughter doing now? She's better? For my luck, yeah, she's totally healthy right now, 100% healthy. So uh, she's running, she's jumping, she's, uh, she's doing uh, sometimes uh, crazy things, too much crazy, that, <laughs> which, is, which is means she's healthy, which is good. Does she run? Uh, just for fun, of course. She's only seven, uh, so I'm not pushing my girls uh, for training, for running. If they want to play on guitar, they're going to play guitar. I don't care. I don't, I don't, I, there is no pressure from myself to make them, uh, make them uh, uh, athletes. But who knows? We'll see. Uh, time is going to show us. But uh, so far, yeah, she's, she's running as well. She represents the school and also uh, last, last days 
my both daughter they want some uh, kind of uh, area meeting which which means she can go right now for uh, more uh, nationals or something like that which is very nice of course and uh, when i look at them when i watch them when they are running i can see myself even you know if we talk about tactics so it's uh, i have uh, my my eyes uh, are like uh, how you call it. I mean, uh, I'm not crying, but uh, you can see uh, like, emotional. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. it's uh, it, it's beautiful. Now, so far, finally, I can spend a lot of time with my with my kids in the home, and finally, I can understand how it's to play with the kids all the time. You know. Yeah. Do they understand that you were a professional athlete, that you won medals, or are you just their daddy to them? No, no. Uh, they don't care. I mean. Uh, they know uh, they of course they know i'm i'm multi medalist let's say from the awards or europeans but uh at the end it doesn't matter you know for them i'm always going to be them daddy and it doesn't matter i'm going to be world champion or i'm going to be number 100 in the world it doesn't matter i'm still they still going to love me the same so when you were their age were you fast already when did you start running uh not really i mean in them age i was doing everything like they are doing right now uh, same you know they represent school in the basketball in, in the running and the other events as well so me i did the uh, same in when i was them age so uh my opinion this is best uh, thing they can do right now in this age just do everything what they want and there will be right moment in the future for uh, get some decision mm -hmm. So you, you started running because your parents want you to be active. How did it start for you? Honestly, honestly, I was uh, playing football as 90% of young boys, you know, and uh, I did the same and I love football. And be honestly, I hate that time running, you know, I hate athletics. And uh, once there was just occasion to go for uh, some event from the school. And because of that, I don't have to be in a, in a class that moment. You know, I can go for the track. Yeah, that's I'm, I'm honest with you. And I just I just came for this uh, small competition, and I don't know how I did it, but uh, I remember that I uh, I used some two big stuff from my brother. You know, two big spikes and uh, some t-shirt and so on, just to look like a, a professional athlete. You know, but I wasn't, of course. And uh, I don't know how, but I won this race. I did a record of my area. It was second time in uh, in Poland that time. So uh, next day I just uh, finish with the football and I start to run and I love it. From this moment I love it. So let's say I can say it's it's because of the small success that that's yeah. how I start to run. Okay, so you could feel you had potential and you wanted more. Yeah, yeah. So I don't want to spend so much time in a, in a class. That's why I can run. <laughs> no, of course, I'm, I'm kidding. You know, it was, it was just success, kind of small success. But still, it was one of the best results in my country that moment. So why not, you know? How old were you then? It was when I was uh, 14. Okay. Did you run cross country? Yeah, many times. I start from the cross country as well. I mean, my coach, my brother, he was my coach. He used to be my coach. So uh, he believes that... Uh, the best kind of training you can imagine, you know, across uh, cross country. So, so uh, I did it a lot. I remember once in 2006 when I was 18, I guess, I promised myself because there was a big possibility to fly to um, Fukuoka in Japan. I really want to be in Japan. And that's why I decided to go for a longer distance in the nationals because only first the only gold medal from the long distance was able to go for a uh, world cross country in Fukuoka. Okay. So okay. I decided to do that. I won it, and I and I and I uh, yeah, and I flew to Japan. So I I that was one of my dream. I make it true. I guess you went to a lot of places with track and field. Uh, yeah, but uh, you know how it works with the uh, our runners. I mean, we we maybe we are traveling in the whole world, but to be honest. Only what we are seeing, it's a huge airport, amazing and nice stadium and a hotel. That's all, you know? Yeah, yeah, I know. Tell me about your, your relationship with your brother, as a brother and as a coach, because we don't see it often. Of course, it, it was not easy relation because uh, he was only six years older than me. Mm. In my opinion, you have to uh, respect your coach always, you know? I mean, if you want to do some success, you have to respect this person. I mean, just to listen to her. 100% uh, uh, focus of that and uh, tr you have to trust him in 100% as well but he was my brother so you know sometimes 
if you don't like something, maybe some kind of session, or maybe you want to go for a party and then your brother, not coach, your brother say, hey, Marcy, you have to stay in the hotel because mm -hmm. tomorrow we have a hard session or something. So uh, it was not easy because that time you can say to him some bad th things, bad words, let's say, you know. Yeah. So, uh, But you can't because uh, he's your coach as well. I mean, mm -hmm. he, you have to respect him. I was respecting him 100%. So... That's why it was not easy relation. And sometimes when you even stay private as a family, let's say during the Christmas time, he was my brother that time, of course, but still you can do whatever you want, you know, because coach is watching you all the time. So <laughs> it's too much. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was not easy, but uh, because of that, we did that many things in on track and field, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, many times you can hear that your dad is your coach, your uncle, your grandma, whatever, but never brother, you know. Did you ever hear that other example? You didn't know that? No, no. me too. So uh, you can imagine how hard it was for us, but still, uh, maybe that was our weapon, you know? I mean, he knows me very well. I'm thinking about that sometimes, and I realize that he knows me better than myself, you know? Maybe that was our weapon, and because of that, I get so many medals, and uh, I was on the stage for uh, 16 years, let's say, without any injuries, and top all the time, all finals, and so on. So. Uh, it was not easy, but if I have to choose again, I would take same. What do you think made him special as a coach and what uh, made it possible for you to have so much success? It's hard to say, but uh, for sure he was study all the time, you know. He was hungry all the time of new knowledge, you know. Yeah. Because many coaches, they are thinking they are the smartest guys ever, you know, and they don't need any help. And them uh, training is the best one. They don't want to learn some new things and so on. But with Thomas was totally different. He was trying all the time to catch with some other coaches, with athletes and get some talk with them, you know, get some lunch because maybe then we can, they talk about the training, about new methodology of training. So uh, he always was hungry of the knowledge. That's why uh, I respect him as well. And uh, he was same as me or maybe even more focus on the training than, than me, you know? I mean, uh, he also had family, he had wife, he had a uh, son, but he was stay with me 300 days a year out of home. He don't want to get any satisfaction from his private things. He want to have satisfaction from our both success, you know? So uh, that was the key as well, I guess. Did you always believe in yourself from the beginning? Uh, yeah, even even at the beginning, I believe myself more than later, you know, when I already get some medals. I mean, from the beginning, I, I believe I can still move the mountains. It was like sky is the limit for me that moment. It was because I was young. There was no pressure. My imagination was still huge, you know. I don't care about nothing. I just want to run. I just want to training. And I just want to be the best uh, in the world. So uh, I believe that nothing can stop me. Later, I realized it's not that easy, you know, I already can see some uh, limits, many problems came. So then you are thinking different way. But I, when, when you are young, when you start, everything is possible. What were you thinking when you went to Barcelona in 2010 for the European Championships? Because you won there, yep. the 800 meters. Did you know you were going to win? Were you very confident? I can tell you something funny. It was only one moment I was 100% sure I'm going to be winning this race. Before the European, I, I did many races, uh, Diamond League and so on. And uh, during these races, I never will lose with any European. I always stay all the time on the podium of Diamond League and I did uh, really good results. And uh, I remember a situation that a few days before a competition, my colleague, he called me and he asked, Marcin, because there is a good bet for your name. What do you think? You're able to win or something? And I, I remember that very well. I just told him that, just uh, bet everything you got on my name, you know? I was 100% sure. And after that, I never did think like that. And after the European, when somebody called me, I said, hey, man, just don't disturb me. I don't care about this. I want to focus on the training. But in that moment before Barcelona, I told my, my colleague, just bet everything you got. And do you think it helped? The confidence helped in the race? Yeah, I guess. I guess. Yeah, I was really very confident. And I was, I, I'm not sure, I was 22, I guess, in Barcelona or 23, sorry, 23. So uh, as I said before, it, that was the period when I believe I can do everything, you know, so yeah. no one can stop me. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I was very confident. But you also have to remember there is a small line, very tiny line between be confident and be arrogant. I was confident. 
And how much do you, you remember of races like that? I mean, I'm watching my race uh, many times because this is one of the moments during my presentation when, when I'm doing power speech. So okay. the moment when I won in Barcelona, so I was watching that many times. So uh, be honest, from the race, from this moment, I don't remember nothing, but I was watching that many times and then I, I can imagine how it was, you know. Okay. I wanted to, to ask you about your relationship with uh, Adam Chot because mm -hmm. I know from seeing you guys on the circuit that you're really good friends, mm -hmm. which can maybe be surprising for people who know you as opponents from the same country. Maybe you guys wanted the same thing, and but you're really good friends. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. You know, it was not easy relation. I mean, because uh, everyone uh, wants to be a champion, you know. We both want to be champion of the world, not of your uh, small place, uh, your area, you know, but of the world. And there's not so many situations that there's two that good guys in the war country. I'm not counting Kenya, let's say, of course, but in other mm -hmm. country, there's not so many situations when, when you can see two, one of the best guys uh, in the world and they they have huge potential to do that you know so uh it was not easy but at the end of this uh, we all the time uh, we've been great friends you know as as you know uh, we many times travel together uh, let's say to Levien for a race indoor and uh, you know that we always ask for the same room you know because yeah. we're gonna stay together or something because yeah. uh, we're gonna be Enemies on the track tomorrow, let's say, during the race. Everybody wants to be a uh, champion. Everybody wants to win. But uh, at the end, we, we stay a uh, great friend. So uh, he helped me many times with some private problems. Sometimes I helped him as well. He was one of my guests during my wedding. And I also been in his wedding. And uh, we spent together much more times than with our family, you know. And I believe that's why we've been so many years at the top level fight all the time, push each other. And uh, because of that, we are one of the best athletes because we always want to improve. You know, we want to be the best always. And I also remember a situation that, let's say, once I did national record for a 1K, next week uh, he beat him again. And then I was waiting another one month, let's say, to beat him again or something, you know. So it was uh, it was kind of uh, like a cram with uh, Steve, uh, Owet and also Sebastian Coe, you know. Yeah. So uh, maybe we didn't do world records, but uh, national records, but still, you know, we've been one of the best athletes in the world. And uh, from the one side, we've been great friends. And from the other side, he was my biggest enemy ever, you know. <laughs> also, the funny story about our situation is that uh, he's totally different kind of person than me, you know, totally different. Mm -hmm. he's, he's thinking in different way. He was training totally in different way because he was more like 400 meter. 800 meter and yeah, I was 815. We have a totally different philosophy of life and we are just totally two different uh, guys. But uh, we stay together in the, on the one line during the competition, during the race. And we finish always like 500 next to, to each other, you know, you know, all the time, but totally different training, totally different philosophy. But on the track, we, we represent exactly the same level. And this is show to everyone, let's say, that uh, there's many, many ways to, to be champion, the many ways to be a champion, you know, totally yeah. different training. There is no one uh, reception. Uh, Recipe. Exactly, for the, to be a champion or something, you know. There's many ways and we just meet somewhere in the middle and we both represent the same level. And you retired the same year, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it, it was not the plan, you know. I mean... Yeah. Uh, for Adam, it was the plan already to finish in that in that year. Uh, me, I uh, it was just some uh, bad situation, uh, private situation. But still, yeah, I mean, uh, so at the end we finished same year, but uh, I start two years before him. I'm older than him for two years. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe tell us about things you learned from other athletes on the circuit, from him or from other people? I'm learning all the time, you know, even right now. I'm a very ex experienced guy as an athlete, as a businessman as well, because I'm doing many business as well, but I'm still uh, learning all the time, you know. It doesn't matter with who you talk, some, all the time you can get some new uh, tips, advices, and so on. So uh, so it's it's hard to say from who I was learning something, but for sure, because I, because, uh, I was athlete, I'm working different than all other people around me, let's say. You know, we, we react, let's say, much faster. Our behavior is totally different. 
if you want to be a champion, you have to, the job have to be done perfect in a whole way, you know. So uh, right now in business, in private life, I'm thinking the same, you know. So uh, and that's why I'm doing this power speech because uh, I want to show how to be a champion not only with sport because uh, it's same kind of uh, character and so on. This decide about you want to be success man with the business or private life or sports or not. So. That's why I'm doing that because uh, we are working totally different than normal human being, let's say, you know. But do you think it is because you learned so much from sport or is it because you were already different and that's what made you a champion? Uh, I guess th this is because uh, what I was learning during what I was athlete. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And, uh, you know, you have to sacrifice everything to be champion. And uh, I just, just uh, you know how to do that in private li life as well. I mean, if you if you have some goal, You're going to do that. If you are an athlete, you're going to do that. Is it worth it? Totally. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I'm 35, so I'm still young. I mean, the life is starting right now, you know, and yeah. uh, I have a, let's say, really good start right now for the, with the private life uh, as, as I did many things during uh, being athlete. Of course, I miss many beautiful moments, especially if we talk about our kids. I miss almost everything because, as I said before, I spend around 300 days a year out of my home from last 17 years. So I miss many beautiful moments. But uh, right now I have a newborn. I mean, uh, I, I got I got a kid. He's uh, he's seven months right now. So finally, I can stay home. I can see how is he, you know, grew up, and uh, I can feel all these beautiful moments. So there's no way that you're gonna back to the past. There's no mm. change. So all these beautiful moments already left, of course. But uh, many people, they want to have the same life what I have right now, you know. So you, ne you never know how it's going to be in different way, in different life. But uh, I'm not thinking in this direction, you know. I'm just a happy person. Um, uh, I did many great things as athlete. And uh, I'm just getting new goals right now. I want to make my dream come true as well with the private life, with the business. And uh, I'm happy anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I invited you, you told me life is good and stuff. And you know, sometimes when athletes retire, you can feel like it's like a small death when they stop yeah, competing. Yeah. But you look very happy. I'm happy about that. To be honest, uh, my opinion, it's not just a lot of athletes. My opinion, it's more like more than 80% of athletes, they, they finish with the many problems. Even right now, I can, I'm, I'm talking with many friends, they are still athletes, let's say, but they knew It's going to be uh, soon they're going to stop and they have no idea what, the, what they're going to do after that, you know, because uh, to be honest, we have good, really good life as athletes, beautiful. I mean, maybe a lot of sacrifices, of course, but from the other side, you know, I'm, I'm just, let's say, I'll give you an example. I'm, I lay down in my bed in my home, let's say, and I receive my email. There is a plane ticket to New York. I'm flying to New York for free. I mean, I'm not paying for that. Of course, it's not for free because I was working for that whole my life. But, you know, someone paid for the ticket. I flew to New York. I'm going to stay in a nice hotel uh, close to Central Park. I'm going to get some race. I'm going to get some money. I'm going to earn some money back home. And uh, it's, it's a nice life, you know. But uh, after when you stop with the track and field, you have to pay for everything for yourself. You are not traveling in the whole world anymore because there is no money or there is a, you have a job. There is no free time and so on. So uh, they realize that uh, it's not that easy. And because of that, many athletes, they try to back to the sports again, you know, but it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's never works like that. I mean, uh, you're never going to be that champion like before. And uh, this is not really good idea. But unfortunately, many athletes, they doing like that because they have no other plans. They have no idea what to do in the real life, let's say. You know? yeah. So uh, that's a huge problem. And because of that, in Poland, they start working about some project to help somehow with the retirement athletes, you know, when they finish okay. their career, they're trying to help them somehow. Still, it, it doesn't change a lot right now for this moment. Maybe it will, but for this moment, it's a, it's a very hard situation. And I know it's not hard only in Poland, but in general, in the whole world, you know. Yeah. So correct me if I'm wrong, but you're a four-time European champion. You've got eight European medals, five indoors, three outdoors. But when it comes to the world championships, you got very close to the medal many times. You eventually got one a medal outdoors. We'll talk about it later. When talking about your fourth place in Daegu and your fourth place in Moscow, you said, I quote, I'm not Rudisha. He can make a mistake and still win it. I needed a perfect race. Mm -hmm. 
Can you maybe tell us about mistakes you made? Because a lot of people listening are athletes themselves. So I'm sure they would love to learn from mistakes you made. If you can maybe tell us about, I don't know if it's about Daegu or Moscow. Yeah. It was. Well, it's surprise uh, actually what you say right now. I mean, it's it's hundred percent um, correct. Yeah, but uh, how you get it? I mean, <laughs> where did you find it? I read it online in an interview for European Athletics, I think. Okay, all right. It was an interview in English because I don't speak Polish, so something right. you did in yeah, English. Yeah. yeah, but it was exactly as you said. Yeah, and uh, it was exactly my words. Yeah, and uh, in the both of these uh, finals, I did huge mistakes. You know, and and it was not only my fourth place there. I also was number four in the Göteborg in the European Championships indoor. I was number four in the uh, Junior World Championships in Beijing. Rudisha was running that time with me as well. He won it. I got many, many four places in my life, you know, and that's why it was so painful. At the beginning, maybe not much, not that much, but uh, later when it was another fourth place and another and another, it was painful a lot. Yeah, I remember exactly my mistakes. Uh, in Daegu 2011, I was European champion that time uh, from Barcelona. I was silver medalist from Paris uh, 2011 indoor. And I flew to Korea with one of the best results in the world. I was really good, perfect uh, uh, shape at that, that moment. I remember that uh, after 350 meters, there was some gap. I was quite in a box, but uh, Kaki, I remember that was Kaki. He did some gap already. I mean... He don't want to run just next to the line. So that's why he was more in the middle of the line. So okay. I was looking at that and I, and I see my good moment to attack that moment. And I was trying to pass him from inside. And that moment he re realized that. So he just jumped in front of me. Not because he wants to do that. It was during the races like that. You know, I just, he just punched me or something. If you want to check, you can find it in the internet that you can see that I was did, let's say, two or three steps on the grass that moment because he okay. just pushed me. And there was no uh, possibility to jump in again to the box. So that's why I have to wait. Then everybody passed me and I just jumped to the track again with the last position. 400 meters to go, you know. So in that level, you can't do yeah. that crazy mistakes. If we talk about Moscow, I was much better performance that time. I was much more, I was much more experienced, and uh, all sign in the sky shows me that that's gonna be my medal. It's gonna be my day, you know, because it was 2013, 13 of August, and I was born 13 of June. And I always said that unlucky 13. That's my lucky number, always, you know. Okay. So it was only 13 that that day, and. Uh, I believe myself and I knew I'm in great shape and uh, all signs shows that it's going to be my day. But uh, I did quite a similar situation, even worse than in the group because uh, I was stopped during the race twice. I mean, 400 to go, they push a lot, but uh, I, was so, I was so nervous or excited, I don't know, and I was trying to pass all these guys uh, after 400 meters, but they also kick in the same moment, you know, so... I really push, I lose a lot of energy, but I couldn't pass anyone. <laughs> so I have to stop again and, and be uh, again uh, at the last position. And then 200 meters to go when I was really kick, there was some guy who was in the final, like, a, let's say he shouldn't be in the final, but he was. I mean, he just did one good race in the semifinal and that's all. You never hear about this guy again. But uh, anyway, he was in the final. He lose all energy, 200 to go, and he stopped. And I couldn't pass him. So I have to stop with him again wait then everyone pass us and then i can pass this guy I still continue running then i also remember that after moscow i was back home with the plan that to finish my career already you know i mean okay. yeah i was only 25 or 26 i don't know i did many great results i did 143 many times that moment already but uh because of this another fourth place you know in my career that was my fourth or fifth five place already in the international uh, big competition so i just back home and i I told my wife that I'm going to finish. I'm going to quit. I don't care. I just want to stay home. and I don't want to do nothing for this moment. But uh, it's always great to have some people like family, like your friends, like people who cheers for you all the time, not only in the good moments, but also in this worst. And I remember that uh, she said, hey, Marcin, you're stupid. You can't stop right now. Your sacrifice is too much already. Your moment is going to come. So I decided, okay, I'm still going to try. We'll see. I don't know. And next week, I was competing in Zurich with all these guys who I, I was competing during the final in Moscow. 
and I did 143 and I was second in this race. So as you see, I was really strong and that was a good moment to get some medal. But because my two crazy mistakes, it's uh, I didn't. So. And when did you decide to move to the 1500? I always knew from the beginning, I start my career, I knew that my future is going to be 1500 meters, always from the beginning. But uh, I start with 800 and it was all the time this unlucky fourth places, you know. I all the time was trying to push myself. I want to improve, I want to get this medal, you know. I was trying that every year, every next year was same. And finally, when I get my medal, let's say in 2014 in Sopot World Championships Indoor, I took bronze, but uh, during the ceremony decoration, this, they disqualify me because I step on the lane, you know. And during again, the ceremony, it was already in the place where it was ceremony. I was I was stayed there for waiting for my medal, Oof. and then some just Garrick just came in and she said, "I'm I'm disqualified." So we just changed with the Osaji, and he he took my medal, you know. So uh, and that was in Poland. Yeah, yeah, it was in Poland exactly. As you see, there was many really bad moments in my life in my sports career. But I never, uh, never give up. I was trying all the time because I was trying to improve that I'm going to be, I'm going to get this medal. Finally, one day, it was 2017. My goal was, of course, to be in the world championships for 800 again. And I did it two races, hits and then uh, semifinal. And I was the first person to not get to the final. So I was number nine. So uh, if I already have been in London, and I also uh, qualified for 1500 meters. I mean, I was focused only for the eight, but uh, if I already was not in the final, so I was thinking maybe maybe I should try, who knows? Maybe it's gonna, if I'm already here in London, so why not? And I did it. And as you know, I was number six in the, in this final for 1500 meters. meters. Uh, first time in my life that in that big event, I tried 1500 meters. With the big uh, success, I can say number six in the, in the world. Why not? So uh, that was exactly the moment when I decided to move for 1500. I said, it's going to be the right moment. I'm not going to be younger anymore. <laughs> so uh, this is the last call to get in for 1500 meters if I still want to do something. And uh, that was my lucky shot. Yeah. But you said you, you knew from the beginning you were going to move yeah. to the 1500. Does it mean you already train as a 1500 meter runner? Yeah, yeah. I never was training like typical 800 meter guy. I always did crazy mileage, like okay. for 800 meters. And uh, and because of that, if you watch my few races, you can see, I mean, my, my tactic almost in 99% was that I was the last one during the race always. And after 400 meters, I tried to, you know, pass guys and uh, just uh, accelerate a little bit. But uh, I was doing that because I was not fast enough to be in the front. My personal best for 400 was 48 or something, you know, so and sometimes we start in 50 seconds. So I was just not able to be in the front. So that's why I keep the last position all the time till the last 200 meters. And then, you know, I kick all the time. But uh, it was my uh, strategy because I was not able to run faster at the beginning. So uh, and this is because I was doing uh, this 1500 meter uh, training, let's say crazy mileage and uh many reps all the time and the short rest everything what you're doing for 1500 meters yeah okay would you say one distance is harder than the other between the 800 and 1500 you know everyone gonna said that his distance is the hardest one everyone would say that 400 meter guy will say 400 and uh, <laughs> 800 800 whatever but i'm one of the not so many guys that i try both in the top top level you know i was one of the best for eight and one of the best for 1500 meters so i can say it uh, with the 100 percent 1500 meters it's definitely much harder than 800 meters definitely and it it's almost because that it's double to run in this case it's not everything we with not with the whole uh, events but in this case when you move from 8 to 15 you almost have to do everything double, you know, the training, okay. more uh, reps and the rest is uh, much shorter and the uh, double mileage and the double everything, you know, so it's <laughs> very hard. And I can say that uh, with the hundred percent from my heart because I did it both and I know it very well, how it tastes both. How did you work on your kick? Is it something that was natural for you? Mm, maybe not natural because I was not speedy guy, you know, I was not speedy Gonzalez, but, uh, that was the philosophy of training of my coach, you know. Training is not start when you put spikes on your foot, 
but real training is start after let's say eight reps and you still have to do last two then the mm -hmm. training is start you know when you are very tired and so on and then you have to kick at the competition and then you have to kick on the training as well so uh i always last reps i did it much faster than previously so uh this is one of the way of course but uh to be also honest it was uh when you watch all my races i was not really kicked it looks only like that but i just keep the same speed all the time you know all these guys when they start let's say 50 seconds they finish in 55 me mm -hmm. i start 53 and finish 52 so it's almost same but it, i just keep the the pace all the time and uh, when you watch us together, when I pass them, you can see that uh, I was really kicked, but I was not. I was keeping the pace all the time. Yeah, they were just slowing down. Yeah. yeah. So you finally got your outdoor world medal in 2019 in Doha. What do you think made the difference that day? Mm, the first world medal I did one year before in, uh, in, in the indoor, but it's different, indoor, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah but it's, it's totally different uh, game. In Doha first time in my life i can feel myself that i'm like a i'm like a robot i'm like a machine you know i was mm -hmm. first time in my life it's it's also because i was working a uh, few years already with uh, the psychology guy Darek novitsky and uh, i was like a computer i was like a robot he just put some program to my head and i and it's not because uh he just put something to my head, you know, it was because I believe myself. I mean, I was working with him uh, many, many years. We did a great job and I know myself. I knew that I'm in the perfect moment in my life as athlete. It was perfect age, like 32, I guess. And one month before Doha, I did a really good, nice uh, national record, like 331. Also, another thing is, I always knew, I always uh, say that I'm like a tournament guy, you know, always. I mean, maybe I'm not best uh, runner uh, if we talk about the Diamond League, but I'm definitely one of the best if you talk about the tournament. Because of the different rounds? Because of the rounds, you have to be smart during that uh, also. And, uh, and the, the way how I was training, it was always like that. I never trained for the one shot, for the one race. And many did, many people, they're doing like that. They, they're not really sure when the shape is going to come. They're just training. They just push all the time. And if it's going to be, it's going to be. If not, if not, it doesn't matter. But with me, I always uh, focus on the tournament. I was training for that to be ready to start day after day. This is the first reason. And the second one, the shape was always where it should be. I did many good races during Diamond League as well. But it was never my my goal. It was just some stop during uh, my my way to to get the awards medal or something, you know. So uh, I always was hundred percent ready during the tournament, and this is also huge uh, bravo to my coach because he he was the person who controlled that, who controlled my my shape. What do you think makes the difference between a very very good runner and one of the very best ones? Is it physical is it the talent or is it the mindset my opinion in the first uh, number one is a uh, hard 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 training you know and mm -hmm. uh, i always said that probably you know this motto of like let's say kenyans they said train hard win easy this is kenyans europeans say train smart not hard and Lewandowski said, train smart and hard. You know, I just connect this both. And this is the best way for me. And maybe at the beginning, when I won my first race, when I was 14, when I did a real record, something, maybe that was a huge talent, of course. But a uh, few years later, when you're going to compete for it, when you want to fight for the awards medal or Olympics medal, there is only hard training and uh, sacrifices and everything what you've done is because of your hard work. Can you maybe tell us about the mental preparation you did? Examples of stuff you did with your coach, mental coach. It's funny because uh, I don't know, uh, it was everywhere in the whole Europe or in the whole world or just in Poland. But there was some moment, uh, some campaign in Poland that uh, in commercial TV and so on, there was always, they repeat like, you are the best, you are the champion and uh, things like that, you know. And it was funny for me all the time because... Uh, the real uh, mentally training is totally different. One of the best things we we training a lot, it was the way how to recover. I was working with the mental coach, how to, uh, how to rest, how to get recovery, how to 
thinking in positive way. Once even, you know, I give you an example that I came to my mental coach and I asked him, hey, Darek, maybe there is something wrong with me because I'm not really care for uh, what's happened for some other guys, let's say, or I'm not feeling them problem or something, you know? And he say, Marcin, and what that's going to give you if you're going to think about this way? I mean, it doesn't help me nothing because I'm not able to do that. But if I can focus just on my training, on my problem, how to be happy, how to keep the smile all the time on my face, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help me much more than thinking about the problems on, in the whole world, you know? So I just start to focus about myself. Of course, there was a important people from around me, like my family, my kids and my friends and so on. But I was generally thinking about myself. And this is one of the way as well. And the second one is a recovery problem. And then next thing is a visualization. Okay. It, that was very important for me as well. And even before I flew to Tokyo or to Doha, let's say, I was checking on the internet how the stadium is looking, let's say. Like... Uh, I was trying to watch as many movies as possible just to know the stadium. It's because when you're going somewhere first time, your your body, your, your head is just afraid, you know, because there's a mm-hmm. new place for you and something you are thinking, how to get somewhere, how to get to the um, warm-up area, how to get to the stadium, whatever. But for me, if I already know the stadium from the movies, I know where is everything. I don't have to lose my energy to thinking or stress where is something or what to do there or why the truck is blue here, not red or something, you know? (laughs) Maybe it's stupid. Maybe this is small things. But if you want to get world medals, as I said, you can't do any mistake. Maybe Rodisha can, but on my level, (laughs) level, I have to be 100% perfect everything. And, you know, if you talk about the stadium, we're going to see the first time. So I'm also going to give you one example during the uh, World Championships in Doha 2019 when I get medal. It was also a little bit kind of poker, let's say, because uh, I flew to Doha just one day before my race. Okay. Maybe I can do that when I was racing in, uh, in Oslo, when it's same climate, same time zone and so on. But in Doha, it was a little bit different time zone, not too much, but still. But the biggest uh, thing was the climate, you know, humanity and, uh, and so on. So uh, everyone just came there one week before already just to get used to the climate, the weather and the sun and temperature and so on. But I, as I said, it was kind of poker. I don't want to stay there because I realized that with my coach that one week, it's still going to be not enough to get used to this climate, you know. One week, it's nothing. I mean, so if you want to use to that, you have to spend there, let's say, one month or two months yeah. or even yeah. more. So what for be there and uh, feel all this atmosphere? Everyone is nervous. If the stadium, anyway, it's going to be, uh, there was a uh, air condition in the, in the stadium. So I just flew to Doha. I did one session in a gym. I was jogging on the treadmill. And next day, uh, I also uh, was training on the treadmill. And I just go to the warm-up area before the race and I, and I compete. And that was the perfect way because uh, I was not stressful and, and so on. I, when the whole athletes, they stay already in Doha in this crazy hard climate. I spent one more week in San Moritz where it was beautiful weather, beautiful views, you know. No one was there already because everyone stay already in Doha. So I was there alone with my coach, with my team. And uh, we just spent a good time and just flew to Doha to get medal. Would you say you you loved winning more than you you hated losing or you hated losing more than you loved winning? Of course, I love winning. This is this is what for I was training. I want to be a champion, but this is also one point that uh, I'm talking during the power speech. To be champion, it's so easy, you know. I mean, maybe the way to get champion it's crazy hard. But champion it's to be champion it's very easy. I mean, you get good money everyone wants to get the picture with you everyone knows you and uh, it's very easy you know so everyone can do that me you and your friends every, everyone everyone can be a champion but not everyone can stand up when you fall down you know not everyone can do that i mean many people already they just want to finish career they don't want to they don't have enough power to stand up again and uh, still fight and so on but to be a champion is very easy so the point is, yeah, of course, I love uh, winning much more than losing. But when you lose, it's the only way how to learn how to be better than before. Yeah. 
Would you say having kids changed your um, your mindset as an athlete? Yeah, 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 definitely. And uh, in Moscow, 2013, I was 26 and my wife, she wasn't pregnant. So I, we were waiting for uh, my, my first daughter. She born one month after World Championships in, in, uh, in Moscow. And I remember words of my coach, my brother, that moment he didn't believe that I'm still going to continue the same level when the kids were born, you know, because he thought that I have to focus more and uh, much more problem and uh, problems with the kids. He's going to be sick all the time. I have to spend this time, much time in home and so on. So at the beginning, he didn't believe that, that I'm still going to be professional athletes. But uh, for myself, it was one of the best moments of my, my career, you know, and because of that, I was so happy. That's why one week after uh, Moscow, as I told you, I did 143 in Zurich because I was happy. And I believe that it's just the beginning of my beautiful career, you know. Then another um, girl, which was maybe even better. I mean, of course, you have much more stress, much more responsibility. But still, I mean, uh, your head is totally different because all what are you doing, you're doing for your kids that moment, you know, not for yourself, but for your kids. And for me, it was extra energy. Maybe for some people, it, it can be too much. But like for me, for my mind, it was much better. And uh, that was one of the best moments of my career when my kids born. And also the second thing was uh, I improved a lot in the moment when I realized that when you lose, it's not end of the world. You know, I just stopped too afraid to uh, be a loser during the race, you know, as I said at the beginning, it doesn't matter for my daughter that I'm going to be world champion. I'm going to be number 10. doesn't matter. I'm still going to be them daddy. And because of that, it pushed me a lot as well. Yeah. Do you think that at the end of your career, when you were on the start line, some young athletes were afraid because they knew you had so much experience and you could handle almost anything. Could, could you <laughs> maybe see in their eyes? Oh my God, he's there. My last races, it was when I was 34. And there was many people that time, let's say Kenyans, they were 18, 19, and we stay on the same line. I was always laughing from that. I was, I was trying to uh, imagine them faces when they, when they watch for a start list and they see Lewandowski, 34, you know, and then they are thinking like, I was laughing that, no, holy shit, again, Lewandowski, when are you going <laughs> to stop? When are you going to stop, you know? <laughs> because... If Lewandowski is there, that means uh, one place is already reserved for him, you know, I mean, <laughs> in the top. So this is, that was funny. I mean, I was laughing from that all the time. But this, that was something that would push me all the time to the front as well. Do you sometimes wish you were born 10 or 15 years later so you could have used the new shoes more, the new, I don't know, the new tracks, the new uh, the wave light or stuff like that? No, no. I mean, there is never good moment for that. <laughs> All the time, something has changed. I mean, uh, I just did my job. I always try to be the best for this moment. If you have spikes with the carbon or not, that was my goal all the time, you know, just to don't have any negative uh, emotion after the race, like, let's say, oh, maybe I should attack 300 meters earlier or something. That was my goal always, just to do best race I can do for this moment. And this is only what I have some, uh, what, I, what I can do something. You're my first Polish athlete on the podcast. Poland has really become one of the strongest nations in track and field right now. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it happened? What's the difference between now and, I don't know, 20 years ago? Everything is changing right now. I mean, you have, it's easier to get some information about the training. You just Google it and you got it many things about the training. Uh, there's many possibilities to get some uh, book about the training, about the supplements about the carbon shoes for sure we have good support from uh, government let's say from the polish federation of truck and field we complain a lot all the time you know because uh, <laughs> if you are world champion you have some small money let's say okay this is it can be true of course but from the other side they they help us a lot with the training you know we have a good system of training in poland if you are in national team, that's mean that the Polish Federation gonna pay for your camps on altitude. Let's say we travel all the time to South Africa, to Kenya, Ethiopia, to US. Sometimes I have to pay for myself, of course, but 80% of them, uh, the Federation pay for all these things, you know, which is, which is uh, very important because if you are not champion, so that's mean you, you don't have sponsors yet. 
So yeah. how you can travel in the whole world for, to be to train for 300 days a year out of your home on altitude, you have to pay for the plane ticket, for the hotel, for the coach, for the physiotherapist, and all these things they cover. So maybe maybe that's the reason. I don't know. Okay. Can you tell me about your book? Is it just available in Polish or is it going to be available? In it's English? only available in Polish. Unfortunately, I have many ask already for that. Maybe it's going to be English versions. That will be cool for sure. You know, that will be something big, definitely. But uh, from the other side, it was never my, my goal. You know, I mean, that will be great if you can read it in English, of course. But uh, the goal from this book was even if one or two person because of this book gonna motivate enough to start training or something mm -hmm. that was already a huge success for myself you know not money how many i'm gonna sell it it doesn't matter and i guess in 40 million uh, country in poland it's enough it's enough to motivate someone and to be happy because of that you know so in your book do you talk about your career it's different book you know it's not typical biography book And it's also mine book. And mine means uh, there's many mistakes, grammar or whatever, because this is my book. There was a ghostwriter, of course, but uh, it was my language. So when you read this book, you can feel that you are talking with me. You get some conversation okay. with me because uh, this is not correct grammar. This is my Polish language, what I'm talking for every day, which is also not perfect. But because of that, you have uh, thinking that you're gonna you're gonna chat with uh, Marcin Lewandowski. So uh, this is one thing which is uh, different in this book. And the second one, it's not typical ab about my life. This is not about the training. It's general about my uh, about my feeling from track and field. What I learn, what I like it or were not. There is a many situation that you don't know even. Well, but if something happened to me during the training during uh i was traveling to moscow because uh, in moscow was crazy story as well not so many people knows about that but all this information you can find in this book yeah so if i don't understand polish i have no way to know what happened in moscow i know and this is shame this is very shame because <laughs> of that but uh maybe one day i mean i'm too busy right now to do something with that but who knows maybe one day it's going to be in english version as well why not what do you want people to remember from your career no my brother he always said that His goal is not to make me one of the best athletes in the world, but makes me good human being. I'm trying to keep this uh, philosophy, you know, of him. I mean, I'm trying to be a good person. If someone likes me, I like it so much. If not, so this is not my mission as well. That's just, I just, I'm just trying to be a good person. I'm helping people. Charity. I'm working charity uh, many, many times as well. I even. Uh, Every year, one of my monthly salary, I, I transfer to some people who need help or something, you know. So uh, one month uh, salary, which is a lot, it's you know. Lot. I mean, it's yeah. the moment when you can help somehow someone. It's beautiful. So, uh, so I just want to be a good person. So if people are going to remember me from this side, not as a champion, or okay, if it's going to be double, if they're going to remember me as a good person and And because of that, he was the world champion or something, whatever. That's cool. But uh, the main thing is to, just to be a good person. Yeah. But I can tell you that everybody working at Lieva remembers you as a really friendly, friendly person. So oh, you're thank always, you so much. Very yeah. friendly with us. So that's definitely how we remember you. Keep coming as, a, I don't know, agent, manager, whatever. You're always welcome. Here, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, I'm always trying that. I mean, I'm, as you see my face, it's always uh, I'm trying to keep smile. And uh, if someone needs any help, I'm ready to do that. If you have any problem, if you need any help or something, I'm very open to help you guys. So yeah, of course. There is one question I ask everybody on the podcast. The podcast is called Athlete Mondial, so it means athletes of the world, because what I love the most about track and field is the fact that it is universal. Anybody can do track and field anywhere mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. what I love about track and field. What do you love about track and field? Yeah, also that uh, everyone can do that. And this is always great beginning to do other sports even i mean maybe if you're not gonna stop with the truck with truck and field but this is great beginning because uh you have to work very general with the your body and uh, so on so when you decide after two years let's say that you go on to play football or you want to play uh, basketball or you want to play tennis this is always always going to be great beginnings for you i like it so much and uh you can meet many 
people from the other countries, you can learn them history and the culture and so on. So it's always great. Yeah. Is there one question I didn't ask you and that you think I should have asked you? We can spend here another two hours and talk all the time because there's many crazy, funny, nice uh, stories and uh, motivating stories. And uh, there's many beautiful moments I can talk about uh, about that. But, uh, but we can do part two one day. I'll invite you. Exactly. Again. I'm always very open, as you know. So just let me know. And uh, So thank you very much. If you don't want to add anything, I will just say thank you. I've told you everything I knew in Polish. That's it. I don't know any more words. I actually know a few, few words in uh, in a friends, but it's not so many as well. So no worries. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Merci beaucoup. Parfait. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for today. Martin, if you're listening, Jengoye. Thank you for your time. And to all of you listening, I hope you liked the episode. If you did, please share it on social media to help the podcast grow. And make sure to subscribe and leave a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to support the podcast, please check the link in the description. Thank you. I'll be back soon with another episode. Bye-bye.